Welcome to the first part of Economics for Business, Lecture 10, which will consider monetary policy. First of all, I would like to recap Lecture 9. First of all, I explained that money supply has expanded at a much faster rate than gross domestic product, which is often referred to as GDP, and measures the value of the output of new goods and services in the economy over a period of time, usually one year. I explained that banks are able to create bank deposits, which enables money supply to expand. And I explained the theories that economists have developed to explain how banks can create new bank deposits and new credit money. I discussed the bank deposit multiplier and also the credit creation theory of banking. In the second part of Lecture 9, I explain the quantity theory of credit and the insights it provides in relation to bank lending. I explained how the economic sectors that are allocated lending by banks are an important factor in determining the economic outcomes of the bank lending and also financial risks arising from bank lending the rapid creation of credit by banks which promoted rising asset prices both property and financial assets promoted new financial innovations such as collateralized debt obligations which are often referred to as cdos a collateralized debt obligation involves the pooling of mortgages a mortgage is a loan that is secured on an asset so that if the debtor fails to repay their loan, then the bank can seize the asset and sell the asset in order to acquire the money to repay the, the debts that are outstanding. But of course, if the asset value is insufficient to cover the remaining outstanding debt, then the bank uh, is ultimately uh, in a situation of losing money on that particular debt. Collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs, were a financial innovation in the United States. These CDOs were sold by commission agents. These are economic agents that receive commission, receive money, for selling loans to borrowers. Initially, the commission agents targeted prime borrowers. A prime borrower is someone in regular employment who is therefore able to uh, repay their debts and so consequently has a high credit rating. But in order to expand the mortgage market, uh, commission agents increasingly targeted subprime borrowers. Subprime borrowers are individuals that are in precarious employment. The fact that they are frequently out of work means that they do not repay their debts regularly. Uh, there are interruptions in debt repayments, which leads to them having a lower credit rating. And the provision of large amounts of debt to subprime borrowers led to the subprime loan crisis in America in 2008, which is very well explained in the YouTube video Crisis of Credit Visualized. And the context is also explained in the Hollywood film The Big Short. A large value of collateralized debt obligations were generated in the United States and were sold in global financial markets and so the resulting default on large amounts of this debt had um, a global impact, which ultimately led to the UK government nationalising Royal Bank of Scotland, which is often referred to as RBS, and also nationalising Lloyds Bank. In Lecture 10, I will discuss the 2008 banking crisis and the problems it created for both governments and monetary authorities. 
The first risk that the banking crisis created was that, was that the banks would lack liquidity and would therefore reduce lending to the wider economy. The second risk that the 2008 banking crisis created was the potential risk that financial institutions would fail for reasons I will explain later. The 2008 financial crisis would produce what Irving Fisher in 1933 referred to as a dead deflation cycle, which would ultimately have a significant impact on economic activity in international economies. In the second part of Lecture 10, I will look at the response of governments and monetary authorities to the 2008 financial crisis, which was also a banking crisis. I will discuss expansionary monetary policies. I will use Keynes liquidity preference theory to explain how monetary authorities can reduce interest rates. I will also use the monetary transmission mechanisms to describe the channels by which lower interest rates can impact the wider economy. When reviewing this lecture, you may find the mind maps that I have created useful. If you put in Maurice Starkey economics into Google, then the search results should come up with my interactive mind maps in economics that are located on the economics network. If you click the hyperlink to this website and you then scroll down, you should see the zip file of the mind maps. You can click on these hyperlink and then save the folder to a preferred location on your computer. Afterwards, you can right click the folder that you've downloaded and extract the file to a chosen location on your computer. Once you have downloaded the mind maps, in order to view the mind maps, you will need to install Mindjet Mind Manager. And there is a link to the Mindjet Mind Manager software uh, just above the zip file for the mind maps. You should be aware that Mindjet Mind Manager is a free software to download for reading other people's content. And so for the purposes of reviewing my mind maps, you do not need to pay for the software. Uh, it's a bit like Adobe Acrobat Reader. You don't need to pay for Adobe Acrobat Reader. You only need to pay for the software if you wish to create your own mind maps. If you click on that link, you will be taken to this my Mindjet Mind Manager web page where you can download the software appropriate for your operating system, whether it be Windows or Macintosh Apple. Once you've installed the software, the what I call the master mind map is economic environment in the folder. And if you open the economic environment mind map, you can see all the topics associated with economic theory. And at nine o'clock on the mind map is the topic box monetary policy, which is the focus for this lecture. If you click on the bubble at the side of monetary policy, then it opens up the sibling fields. And this is a master mind map because it contains hyperlinks to all the other mind maps contained in the folder. So you can therefore click on this link to be taken to the Banks for Money Creation mind map. Click on that link to be taken to the Quantity Theory of Credit mind map. Click on the Monetary Transmission Mechanisms link to be taken to the Monetary Transmission Mechanisms mind map here. So if you click on these links, you can open them up. So the bank uh, credit uh, and money creation mind map relates to lecture nine. Quantity theory of credit mind map relates to lecture nine. Then we have a mind map on monetary policy, liquidity preference theory, speculative asset motive, 
monetary transmission mechanisms and expansionary monetary policy and debt. And remember, at any time, you can expand sibling fields by clicking the circle at the side of a topic box. I would like to discuss the first risk, that is that the banking system lacks liquidity. A lack of liquidity was a consequence of international wholesale financial markets and the London interbank market freezing. And those markets froze because banks did not know whether the banks that were seeking to acquire money in the interbank market had significant quantities of these collateralized debt obligations that would have to be written off and which could therefore cause a bank to become insolvent and unable to repay its debts. So this is often referred to in financial markets as counterparty risk. You need to be aware of what the risk is of a counterparty, the other party to a financial market transaction being unable to repay their debts. So you can work out the sort of risk premium that you need to add to determine the interest rate that should be provided on a loan. And so banks in 2008 were unclear which of the banks were holding these collateralized debt obligations that would have to be written off and could therefore cause the banks to become insolvent. Because of banks being unable to ascertain the credit risks of other banks, they stopped lending to each other. And that caused some banks to lack liquidity, the ability to generate cash required to meet depositors' demands to withdraw money from their bank accounts, as and when the depositors came to the bank to take money out. There is a risk um, of liquidity problems in banks because of maturity transformation. And what maturity transformation refers to is that depositors place their money with a bank for a short period of time, sometimes a couple of days, sometimes a week, a month, a year, possibly a few years. But depositors place their money with a bank for a short period of time. They therefore receive a low interest rate and therefore the bank can make profit because of the low interest they're paying to depositors. Whereas the bank loans money out to borrowers for long periods of time. So, for example, issuing a 25-year mortgage to a borrower is an important uh, reason for bank lending. So the fact that banks are taking depositors' money in for a short period of time, but lending out money to borrowers for a long period of time, that is the maturity transformation. And that creates risks that the banks can run out of money. If a sufficient number of depositors decide that a bank is unable to repay their money and then there's a rush on the bank to withdraw money from the bank, um, depositors actually produce self-fulfilling expectations because a bank is unable to repay all their depositors' money at the same time because the bank has loaned the money out on a long-term basis to borrowers. So all these depositors turning up at the bank for their money means that the bank is unable to repay the depositors their money. Therefore, the central bank acts as lender of last resort to private commercial banks, which means that if no one else is prepared to lend to a bank, then the central bank, in the case of the United Kingdom, the Bank of England, will loan money on a short-term basis to the bank. While this enables the bank to pay, repay their depositors' money, it doesn't prevent the bank having longer-term problems as a result of depositors losing, losing confidence uh, in the bank and therefore moving their money to another bank. The freezing of international financial markets and the London interbank market caused some banks that were unable to access cash from these markets to stop lending to the wider economy. And this creates a credit crunch 
which means that the private sector, both individuals and companies, are unable to access loans and overdrafts. And this reduces economic activity in the wider economy. And the reduced economic activity causes all banks to reduce lending in the economy, which creates a further contraction of economic activity. The next risk is that there may be bank insolvencies and some banks may fail in a financial crisis. And I will explain how this can happen through an old saying, which is that if you owe a bank £100, it is your problem. But if you owe a bank £100 billion, it is the bank's problem. And it is the bank's problem because a £100 billion loan that is no longer being repaid is non-performing. And a non-performing loan must be written off by the bank. And if that loan is sufficiently large in relation to the bank's total loan book, then a bank may have to write down its, the asset side of its loan book to a level that is below a bank's liabilities to its depositors and other creditors, such as those who have made acquired bonds in the bank. And if a bank's assets aren't sufficient to cover bank liabilities, then the bank is insolvent and will fail. Uh, it will have to close. Now, this statement can be extended by stating that if the bank issues money to one million borrowers investing in a single asset class that each borrow £100,000, it is also the bank's problem if the value of an asset class falls because a significant fall in the value of an asset class may cause the value of debtors secured assets to fall below their outstanding debt relating to the asset. And in this situation, the debtor has an economic incentive to default on their loans. And they may default on their loans in large numbers, the American subprime loan crisis that is uh, very effectively explained in the Crisis of Credit video on YouTube. This is the web page for the Crisis of Credit video. I would now like to discuss the third risk that both governments and monetary authorities face in a financial and banking crisis. And this is a consequence of debt deflation. And first of all, I would like to talk about debt in general. When borrowers acquire debt, they are bringing forward future purchasing power into the present period. However, whilst that increases their purchasing power in the current period, in future periods, if the borrowers are unable to acquire new debt, then repayment of previous debt, their debt servicing costs, will require them to reduce consumption if they are highly indebted. So high debt financing costs in relation to income require people to reduce personal consumption. And the consumers that have the highest debt financing costs relative to their income tend to be the poorest members of society. The poorest members of society tend to have the largest debts because in the past they've gained the most benefits from acquiring debts because it's enabled them to increase their purchasing power uh, significantly due to their low incomes. Now, the poorest members of society not only have the largest debts and therefore the highest debt financing costs relative to their incomes, they also have the highest marginal propensity to consume. Now, marginal propensity to consume refers to the proportion of any additional income that the individual consumes. So poor members of society tend to consume a large proportion of any additional income they receive. And similarly, a significant reduction in their income causes them to have to significantly reduce their consumption. And if that happens on a large scale in the economy, 
that can have a significant economic impact. Irvin Fisher in 1933 presented his debt deflation theory and Fisher's paradox is that while borrowers intend to reduce their indebtedness as a consequence of debt repayment, which is often referred to as deleveraging, if there is wide-scale debt repayment in an economy, it creates a deflationary economic environment that causes debtors to ultimately owe more money as they repay more of their debts. This is the ultimate paradox, that as people, debtors repay their debts, they finish up owing more money. And that is a consequence of deflation in the wider economy, increasing the real cost of their debt repayments. And when I talk about real cost, that is the cost of debt repayment after adjusting for inflation, or in this case, deflation, uh, a general reduction in price levels within the economy. And we will talk about how this process develops in the next few slides. So first of all, if there is wide-scale debt repayment in an economy without new debt being issued to counteract that debt repayment, there is an overall reduction in consumer demand within the economy. An overall reduction in consumer demand in the economy causes businesses' sales volumes to fall. And in response to falling sales volume, businesses seek to reduce product prices in order to acquire sales from their competitors. This reduction, wide-scale reduction in product prices across the economy is referred to as deflation. Now, businesses reduce prices in order to try to win sales from their competitors in order to maintain their own sales volume and business profitability. However, all firms will end up matching the reduction in prices. And so not only will there be a general fall in prices within the economy, there will still be a significant fall in sales volumes and business profitability will be seriously reduced. As a consequence of falling sales volumes and business profitability, businesses start to reduce their workforce, which increases the number of people that are unemployed in an economy. And this reduced level of labour demand across the economy leads to a general fall in wage rates. So now we are seeing uh, reduced incomes because of both increasing unemployment and falling wages. Falling incomes reduce debtors' ability to service their debts. Existing debt schedules are unaffected by deflation in incomes and product prices that are impacting the wider economy. Although nominal interest rates may fall, those reductions in nominal interest rates are insufficient to counter counteract the impact of falling prices in the economy. And so debt repayments increase in real terms as a consequence of deflation. So deflation causes unpaid debt to become more onerous for borrowers to repay. Whilst repayments by debtors are reducing the amount of money they owe, the repayments are not fast enough to be prevent an increase in their debts in real terms after adjusting for deflation. And debtors recognise that the real cost of their debts is increasing and so will, so will seek to repay their debts more quickly and at the earliest opportunity, which creates increasing deflationary pressures within the economy. In order to accelerate debt repayment, then debtors engage in a fire sale of their assets such as property and financial assets. Wide-scale attempts by debtors to reduce their indebtedness through a fire sale of assets will lead to significant reductions in asset prices, 
as we saw in the United States in, during the American subprime loan crisis in 2008. And that creates a further source of contraction in the economy. So asset prices fall as a consequence of the wide-scale liquidation of assets, which undermines the private sector borrowers' ability to repay their debts. But also, people see their wealth being reduced as a consequence of the value of their assets falling and so seek to save more in order to increase their wealth back to the, its original level. However, if saving by consumers occurs on a wide scale in the economy, saving is ultimately futile in helping people uh, increase their wealth as explained in Keynes paradox of thrift which has some similar elements to Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory in that Keynes paradox of thrift basically said that the more people attempt to save actually the less they are able to save because by saving more there is a reduction in consumer demand which reduces economic activity within an economy causing incomes to fall, prevents people being able to increase their saving. Savings are a form of leakage. They take money out of the economy and that reduces economic activity. So in the debt deflationary economic context explained by Irving Fisher, creditors become increasingly concerned that the debts they are owed will not be repaid by the borrowers and this causes creditors to place increasing demands on debtors to repay their loans which further accelerates the pace of deflation in the wider economy reducing the price of both new products and services and also asset prices. Attempts by economic agents to repay their debts causes money supply to contract as a consequence of bank loans being repaid. Remember that in Lecture 9 I said that provision of loans causes the money supply to expand. So similarly, repayment of loans causes the money supply to contract. And in this deflationary environment, increasing bankruptcies and unemployment lead to pessimism among econ economic agents about the future state of the economy which causes a further contraction of demand for products that leads to further falls in income. Now, Irving Fisher said that governments can prevent this contractionary debt deflation cycle by reflating the economy. And so Irving Fisher proposed that governments should aim to increase the price level to the average level at which outstanding debts were contracted by existing debtors and then maintaining that price level. So avoiding deflation prevents personal debts becoming more onerous to repay due to deflation. And so people will still be able to repay their debts so you can avoid the debt deflation cycle developing. And so there is the potential for severe economic consequences resulting from falling house and financial asset prices. Because falling house prices will significantly reduce personal wealth. And reduced personal wealth will cause a reduction in personal consumption. People feel less wealthy and so want to recover their previous levels of wealth by saving more. And they can only save more by reducing personal consumption. Also, falling asset prices creates a risk of credit default. Firstly, because falling consumer expenditure will cause a reduction in incomes in the economy as a consequence of reduced output and employment. And so the borrowers will have less income to repay their debts. That's the first factor creating an increased credit default risk. 
The second factor increasing the risk of credit default is that asset prices may in some cases fall below borrowers' outstanding debts. And in this situation, borrowers have a financial incentive to default on their outstanding debts because they owe more than the asset is worth. If borrowers default on their debts in large numbers, then, as I mentioned earlier, the value of bank assets, secured loans, would decline relative to bank liabilities, bank deposits, which creates a risk of bank insolvency. As was seen in the crisis of credit video, which referred to the US subprime loan crisis, the banks could acquire the assets that was secured um, to obtain loans. Um, however, if house prices are falling rapidly, even repossession of the asset and sale of the asset on the open market may not provide uh, sufficient money for the bank to recover the whole of the outstanding loan amount. And so it will have to write off a proportion of its bank loans. And if those the, the write-off of loans causes the bank's assets uh, side of the balance sheet to be reduced significantly and to below the bank's liabilities, then the bank is insolvent and cannot continue trading. It will fail. And we can see that in the United Kingdom, 50% of household wealth is a consequence of real estate values. So a significant contraction in property prices, in real estate prices, would lead to a significant contraction in personal wealth in the United Kingdom. In the Eurozone, 43% of household wealth is accounted for by real estate, by property value. Uh, but in the United States, it's 25%. So the United Kingdom is very susceptible to a con economic contraction resulting from a fall in property prices. And to finish the first part of the lecture, I would like to finish with a statement by Stephen Keane in his book, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? He said, the only way for economists to avoid a substantial decline in aggregate demand and therefore a recession from private sector behaviour alone is for private debt to continue rising faster than gross domestic product. But in a world in which debt necessitates interest payments, at some point aggregate debt servicing costs will exceed the incomes available to meet them.